Okay, last session before lunch. I promise I will try really hard not to go over and, and, and stop you from eating. So this is some work with a, a lot of collaborators here, particularly with my PhD stu student, Raksha Kumar Swami, who's worked really hard trying to understand a little bit about how do we get upper confidence bands for action values and reinforcement learning. And so really the, this talk is sort of gonna be a little bit of an open-ended talk. My goal is not really to present you with uh, highly polished work where we have concrete answers to things. Actually, I kind of want to highlight some questions that I think are open in terms of how do we get upper confidence bounds for action values. And I invite you to, I, I'm going to sort of propose what I think is sort of open right now, and I invite you to tell me if you agree with me if, and there, if there's other things you think that are actually more problematic. So first I'm just going to discuss one direction for computing upper confidence bounds. It's sort of the direction several of us are taking right now in reinforcement learning, and then I'm going to highlight some open questions and issues. So really to sort of step through upper confidence bounds for action values and reinforcement learning, I'm going to kind of assume you haven't thought that much about upper confidence bounds, and I'm going to kind of step through simpler settings first and then tell you why it's a little bit more complicated in reinforcement learning. Okay, so I'm just going to assume this problem setting, we have a general state and action space, could be finite, could be continuous, we're going to be in a Markov decision process. Uh, and our agent's goal is to estimate these optimal action value Q star, that's the expected return under the optimal policy. Okay, and of course we want our agent to be able to estimate this Q star and be confident that it's actually reached Q star, but we want it to do it in a reasonably data efficient way. So we want it to have directed exploration so it can get as fast as possible to Q star, but we want to give it the opportunity to actually explore so it doesn't converge to something suboptimal. So, the, you know, the standard setting that we're used to, and here we really care, I care a lot about direct exploration and data efficiency, and I think upper confidence bounds are one way that maybe we can get that. Okay, so as was sort of highlighted in the last talk, model-based methods have been really one of the, the go-to methods for actually trying to prove things about how we get good exploration and reinforcement learning and actually for using uncertainty estimates, usually on the model. Here I'm going to focus on model-free methods because I'm going to be talking about action values. And I think there's sort of two options that are typically done. In the first case, you might estimate uncertainty directly on the action values. Uh, and in the second case, you might do something like reward bonuses where you do something like pseudo counts or counts to say how, how much have I seen this state and you might add a little bit of value to your reward or maybe you'll say how confident you are about the reward and again, you'll just add some value to that. To, you'll add some extra reward on this time step so it looks like your value on this step is higher than it actually is and it encourages you to go back and re-explore that, that part. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the first one more, estimating uncertainty directly on QSA. Again, this is a little bit more of an open-ended talk. This is my preference, though I don't have that strong of an argument for it yet. But one of the reasons I sort of like the idea of estimating uncertainty directly on the action values is that you let your action values estimate as best as they can the re returns that they have actually seen. And then your uncertainty estimates you can use as a separate mechanism where at some point you might actually realize, oh, I'm quite certain about this state, and you can remove your uncertainty estimates without corrupting your action value estimates. And when we incorporate things into reward bonuses, we kind of couple both the reward and uh, these extra uncertainty values we put in. So in any case, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go forward with this being my preference. And now the question is going to be, how are we going to do it? Okay, so the, that, that's really the question. How do we do this in reinforcement learning? And I'm going to lead up to why this is hard. So let's just start off in the stochastic bandit case, um, where it's a little bit more intuitive about how we compute upper confidence bounds. And I'm going to, for anyone, again, who hasn't thought much about computing upper confidence bounds, I'm going to sort of ease you into it. So here we're going to have no states. Our goal is just to estimate action values Q of A. And each, we have a table of values for each action. We just want to know what's the expected reward for taking this action. And we get these stochastic actions. So really what we're doing is estimating a sample mean. And we know exactly how to estimate confidence intervals around sample means. Um, so for example, if we actually knew our rewards were normally distributed, we might go compute a normal confidence interval. That's not what anyone actually does, but usually we're going to go look at and assume we have an unknown distribution and use some kind of concentration inequality to actually get this confidence interval. And then we're going to go and select the action with the highest plausible value. So we're going to be optimistic in the face of uncertainty and say, um, I'm going to start exploring my space and pull in the arms that have the highest plausible value. Okay, so again, this is something you guys have probably all seen before, and computing these upper confidence, or computing this radius here, and computing this full upper confidence is, is reasonably straightforward. And then we can start moving a little closer to reinforcement learning with uh, contextual bandits. And here now we actually have state or context S, and our goal, it, this is still a myopic setting though, so from a state I take an action, and I get, I want to estimate my expected reward for taking that action. And my actions still don't have consequences in terms of what states I'm going to end up in. So this is the contextual bandit setting. Again, a little closer to reinforcement learning. 
Uh, and still, again, we sort of have some solutions to this problem to some extent. So we know how to estimate conditional sample means. This is something like the regression setting or condition on state, let's say some state vector or context vector. Um, <clears throat> I can say what I think my expected reward is going to be, and I can actually say what I, how confident I am about my predictions. So for example, you might use something like Bayesian linear regression, or you might say if I have a linear function of features, there's a known formula for the variance of the weights, and you can try to go and estimate the variance of your weights. Okay, so we can kind of go and exploit a lot of knowledge we have in supervised learning and in regression to try to get some estimates of confidence. Uh, and one algorithm could be, for example, if you have linear function, you would go get, you would estimate a matrix C of the covariance for your weights, and then you could use that information to say, how confident my estimates on this step. Okay, and that, and that update would look something like this, where now you say with some probability one minus P, this is the true value I have, where you can think of X as a state action feature vector, and W star is the true weight vector, and WT is what your current estimate is, so now you can say that my, the true value is going to be no greater than my current estimate plus this extra upper uh, radius term here, where C is my covariance estimate for my weight matrix. Okay, so like a, a very f simple formula we have here. And so again, we can go ahead and say, let's act with optimism in the face of uncertainty and use this U. We're going to estimate this upper confidence value here uh, by estimating our, our covariance matrix C. Okay, okay so, so reasonably straightforward things to do. Okay, that's sort of the little primer on how would we get upper confidence bounds even in the cases where we have context. And now uh, switching over a little bit, why is this different in RL? So why can't we just do exactly the same thing in RL? Actually, funny enough, the algorithm I'll show you is gonna look very similar, but it still is not exactly the same. And, and there's really kind of two issues that, there's at least two issues that I can see. One of them is that the actions I take now in reinforcement learning influence the context or states that I'm gonna see into the future, which is not true in the contextual bandit, and it influences the rewards I'm gonna see into the future as well. And we have this additional problem that we're bootstrapping, so we don't actually get to see our immediate target right now. I don't take an action from a state and then see a sample of my reward. Um, in RL, we would need to see a sample of our return. So we could possibly do things like fix our policy, run it to completion in an episode, get a sample of the return, um, but Typically what we'll actually do is bootstrap or allow our policy to change along the way, and now we've really deviated from that setting. Okay, so it is gonna be different. Um, there is at least some hope. There's a few things that we can do. So one thing that's nice is we can compute upper confidence bounds in the case where our policy is fixed, so the policy evaluation case. There we can actually make some traction. So imagine we fix our policy. We can go ahead and use some strategies to compute upper confidence bounds. Um, and I'll tell you how, how this relates to control. So there has been several previous algorithms, lots of different algorithms actually trying to estimate distributions over our weights given data we've seen. You've probably heard of them like Bootstrap DQN or RLSVI, these new papers, Bayesian DeepQ networks. Um, a lot of these methods are using, again, using supervised learning strategies. We know how to compute uncertainty estimates in supervised learning. And so they're using lots of these supervised learning strategies to try to get upper confidence bounds by just assuming that there are bootstrap value we have, reward plus gamma times action values into the future, that, that really is just some fixed value, our weights are not involved there. So we have a sample of our target, uh, we have what we're trying to predict, and now we can use, say for example, Bayesian linear regression to say, get uh, uncertainty estimates. This is of course a bit of an approximation because you know, we actually are bootstrapping, or it's an approximation if you use a target network. Uh, so one, one thing that we've done is just gone a little bit further and say, well, is there any way we can actually compute specialized confidence intervals actually for the reinforcement learning setting where we're, we pay attention to the fact that we are using bootstrap, bootstrapping and we are using reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, so we, we do have a, a more particular upper confidence bound algorithm when we have linear value function approximation. But really sort of the theme of this talk is not exactly just to, to tell you about my work and how it's different from before. It's sort of to start thinking a little bit about what are all the upper confidence bound approaches doing. But in any case, if, you, if we do have this update, I just kind of want to contrast it to what it looks like in the contextual bandit setting. So uh, like I said, before the reinforced learning setting, if you're doing at least squares temporal difference learning updates with linear function approximation, in that setting we can characterize the variance of our weights as we get more and more samples. Uh, and then we kind of get back to the same setting that we had before. We can actually get up these upper confidence bound estimates that look very similar. In fact, I just copied this formula right here. And the only difference is how we estimate this covariance matrix C. 
So the covariance matrix in the contextual bandit is gonna look quite different from the covariance matrix in a, our RL setting. But someone here, so me in this case, has handed you how to estimate this covariance matrix C, and then we can just go ahead and apply our regular uh, upper confidence bound strategies. Okay, so if I'm gonna remind you that this was for a fixed policy. So everything sort of works out nicely when we go to the setting where we have a fixed policy. We can really compute these upper confidence bounds. And sort of independently, actually, that's interesting. You might just want to be able to say, for my policy, for a fixed policy, I'd like to know what's my uncertainty estimate, my value function. So if, if for nothing else, you should go check out, you should ask me about the work so you can see that. But anyway, let's move on to the, how does, what does this actually mean for control, which is what we really wanted our upper confidence bounds for in the first place. Uh, so we have these nice sound methods for fixed policies, and now in practice what we're really gonna do is we're gonna take, uh, take these updates and we're gonna sort of estimate the upper confidence bounds for our current policy, and then we're sort of gonna iterate improving our policy and also having our upper confidence track with that. So we're sort of doing like this generalized policy iteration updating. Uh, and a lot of these methods that I sort of mentioned that are keeping this distribution over weights are sort of doing that. They have a set of policies that they currently think are plausible. They sort of are also iter iterating uncertainty estimates or upper confidence bounds, and those two things are iterating together. Um, and so the, the algorithms usually are composed of two things, using some algorithm that is approximating upper confidence bounds, and then because we're in control, also making sure that the variance estimates start off large enough so that we ex actually explore enough. So the variance estimates really have to start out large enough both to reflect that actually our variance estimates in the beginning are probably wrong. So let's start off with the heuristic of assuming that they're big because they probably are big. Um, and we also wanna start off with a wider variance to ensure that our true models are actually within our, our, what would, is implicitly our prior. But let me, let me just summarize what that high level approach is. So the high level approach is we're iter iteratively updating the action values, so which is, telling us what our policy is and our upper confidence estimates together in like this generalized policy iteration strategy. And here I'm sort of labeling this as a generalized policy iteration strategy. The, the previous papers haven't actually called it that. So I'm sort of proposing that this is a, the high level approach and combined with overestimating the variance of the weights initially. So we have a principled approach for policy evaluation. We kind of have this high level strategy for control and then a natural question is does it work? And does it work in theory and does it work in practice? Okay, so I'm gonna just mention first um, what, what the theory says. So right now there isn't a whole lot of theory about using these bounds in RL, but there is actually some really nice theory in this, this paper from Ian actually. I don't know if Ian is still here, but um, from Ian and Van Roy actually about randomized least squares value iteration, and they show that this type of strategy does actually converge to optimal in the tabular case with finite horizon. Um, and so kind of the key concept that they, that they use to prove this is this idea of stochastic optimism. And I really like this idea of stochastic optimism. So I'm sort of pulling it out of that paper and just showing generally how the idea of stochastic, stochastic optimism is important for using upper confidence bounds. So the idea is just after some amount of steps interacting with the environment, so after some steps T, ever more after that, we wanna make sure that our upper confidence bounds, so these Q tildes, which is equal to our current estimates Q plus this extra radius term that's giving us this full interval. We wanna make sure that that's actually an expectation larger than the true Q values. So we wanna make sure that our estimates really are optimistic compared to the true Q values. Uh, and the word stochastic optimism here is just reflecting that this doesn't have to be true for all states and actions. We just need to be true in expectation according to some distribution that I, I won't be able to tell you about right, right now. Okay, so this is sort of nice. It's identifying a property that seems kind of important. It was very central to their proof. And really the, the high, level, high level result is if you have stochastic optimism, if you have confidence intervals that actually shrink, we would like our confidence intervals to sort of start going away. And if you have a valid update rule for your Q values, now you're not just randomly updating your weights, you're actually trying to update your weights towards Q pi. Then we get this nice bound on the regret for any one time step. And so the full regret is just bounded by summing these two terms. Okay, so the, the, the terms FT and GT are just supposed to be generic terms saying, if you have some rate that your confidence interval is shrinking, which is S of F of T, and if you have some rate that the Q values update towards the true Q pi values, G of T, and those things are shrinking to zero, then you're actually gonna have a reasonable regret bound. But really the, the kind of the key thing from he, me here is that in this proof, we really need this idea of stochastic optimism. Okay, so there is some theory for one algorithm that's sort of in this class using upper confidence bound like approaches. Um, 
but it doesn't really match the algorithm design, even though it matches that one, one proof. So like I mentioned, the algorithms iterate confidence intervals and they iterate the comp, uh, current policies together. The upper confidence bounds are not directly saying, how am I gonna get an upper confidence value on Q star? So stochastic optimism is about Q star. It's not about my current Q pi, and our algorithms are not exactly doing that. So uh, it's kind of a, there's a little bit of a mismatch between this sort of generalized policy iteration design we have and this feeling that we need to have stochastic optimism, yet the algorithms seem to work well in practice and our LSV has proven to converge. So I think there's some questions about what's going on here. So let me just mention one thing about convergence for RLSVI. Um, so RLSVI, maybe I should tell you quickly how this algorithm just works a little bit. It ha takes a policy, it goes and gathers data according to that policy, and then it keeps this posterior over weights, and it does a Thompson sampling strategy where it samples weights from that, um, that posterior over weights. So it's not actually using upper confidence strategy, but it is still doing like this generalized policy iteration approach. Okay, but anyway, so they were able to show that their Q, their upper, that they were actually able to show that their Q values were stochastically optimistic, and uh, I think three things were really kind of important for showing that was true. One, they had a finite horizon setting. So in a finite horizon setting, you can actually get this last step correct. It's a myopic problem in the last step. Once you get your value estimates correct in the last step, you can use, take advantage of that fact to then get your value estimates correct two steps from the last step. So I think that finer horizon really helps show that this is true. The, in the proof, the variance estimates also needed to be in, uh, initialized sufficiently high. So again, that's sort of helping you make sure that your values are really above Q star. And, in, and it was for the tabular case as well. And I think the tabular case is sort of important for making sure, even if you initialize your value, your variance estimates high, if you have generalization across states, it's definitely possible that you'll visit some states and it'll artificially pull down the variance for other states and make you think you don't need to visit those states. So there's gonna be all these confounding factors when we move away from tabular. Um, so it's, it is possible that there's some fundamental truth that this kind of generalized policy iteration does allow us to have stochastic optimism, but it's, it's not clear if these three properties were really necessary to show that that was true. Okay, but on the, on the positive side, I'll say that the algorithms do seem to work really well in practice. So it seems like there's something here, something that we should better understand uh, if, if we could say something in theory about them working well. So there's all these different algorithms that have been shown to do nice things in practice. Um, the, you should go look at these papers to see the nice big scaling experiments that they have shown. I'll just show you experiments with our more simple algorithm with linear function approximation that's computing the specific upper confidence bounds for reinforcement learning. And I'll do it nicely in the exact same domain that Marlos mentioned, so I don't even have to explain it that much. It's a, but it's a continuous variant because um, here we, we really care a lot about continuous state and generalizing across features, not for the tabular setting. Uh, but otherwise, the flavor is the same. You imagine you're a fish, you're swimming up against stream, you really wish you could get to, it would be the best if you could get to this right side where you get the most reward, this nice green part. But each time you take a right action, you, the right action only succeeds with a small probability and otherwise you get pushed left, even, even though you tried to go right. So it's really easy to get pushed all the way down here, experience a little bit of positive reward, and start to get confused and converge to the suboptimal policy. And you have to work really hard to directly keep going towards the right to see that that's the right policy, to always go right. <clears throat> And sort of how Marlos mentioned also, it's a, despite how simple it is, it's actually a surprisingly hard problem and lots of algorithms can fail on it unless you're careful about making sure they explore enough. Okay, just a few details. It's, it's a continuing problem with gamma equal to 0 0.99. It starts near the left, so it's sort of encouraged further to get stuck there. And, and we, of course, one of the reasons we choose some of these small domains is so we can do lots of exhaustive runs, lots of parameter sweeps. So for our own algorithm, we fixed these, our parameters across all the domains that we looked at that we're not tuned specifically to river swim. We have some pretty simple parameters in our algorithm. Um, but otherwise, we, we swap the parameters for all the other algorithms. So again, this is not really about the benchmark. I just want to highlight a couple of interesting things. So I was supposed, supposed to motivate to you that, the, that these algorithms that sort of estimate policies and upper confidence bounds at the same time it iterate do seem to have some nice properties, plus initializing variance large enough. So uh, I'll just highlight a couple things. UCLS is this blue line, optimal is this dotted gray line that says if I was always going right from the very beginning, how much reward would I receive? You can never catch up to optimal because you're gonna have to do some exploration to figure out what is optimal. But this upper confidence least squares algorithm is, is managed to do very well. It explores in a very directed way and actually gets near optimal pretty quickly. 
Um, this UC bootstrap is another algorithm of this, of this flavor, and actually it, it sort of emphasizes that it's not enough just to do this estimate policy, estimate um, upper confidence bounds, and iterate. This uh, algorithm, as it was introduced, does, is not careful enough about making sure the initial variance is large, so it actually ends up converging to a suboptimal policy. So it does suggest there's something about making sure we initialize our variance to be large. Uh, and I also want to mention that I don't mean to disparage RLSVI here. I actually, like I said, really like that paper and I like this algorithm. Uh, it's just that it was designed for a different setting, for the finite horizon setting. So it does this thing where it simulates entire episodes and makes sure it gets samples of returns and so it updates its policy much more slowly. If you allow this to continue going, it will eventually get to optimal. Um, our algorithm was designed to update the policy in every step. Okay, and one other thing I also like to mention is uh, just almost a little orthogonal to this, but the, a lot of these works too ha have been designed for the linear case. It's a little easier to design some of these upper confidence bounds assuming something like linear regression or linear function approximation. Um, but then there's something additional that makes it possible to scale. That sort of was done by both us and this other paper called Bayesian DeepQ Networks. It's a very natural idea. I think many, many people are just trying out this idea right now, which is that you can take algorithms that are designed for the linear case, and then you can just extend them to the setting with, where we're learning our function approximator, for example, learning our neural network, by treating the last layer as if it's a fixed feature representation and allowing the neural network to update at the same time. Um, so there's some hope here that some of the, some of the principled algorithms we can actually design for the linear case might actually just immediately port to the nonlinear case. Um, uh, likely not in theory, but in practice it seems like it has some hope there. So this is one of those sanity checks that, that uh, other people were mentioning as well. We really, really just wanted to see if you wanted to take this algorithm and try using it for yourself, or even if you wanted to take something like RLSVI and try using it for yourself, since that was also designed for the linear case. Um, you can actually plug it at the end of a neural network and you can actually get it to learn almost as well in this problem. So it doesn't learn as well as when we gave it its nice tile coding representation, um, but it can do much better exploration than say epsilon greedy with DQN and here we swept many different epsilon rates and decay schedules for DQN and if we sweep it very carefully it can do just as well and if we sweep it a little less carefully it doesn't do as well. That's a common theme here. Directed exploration is better than epsilon greedy. Okay, so Maybe I will keep this a little bit short and sort of wrap up the, the question that I've been trying to pose throughout this, this talk. So really w w what I'm trying to emphasize here is that we have all these nice algorithms that are coming out that are actually saying, hey, we can estimate upper confidence bounds on our action values. It's been a long time in reinforced learning where we've mostly been doing model-based things and not as much uh, looking at upper confidence bounds and action values. And we're seeing that we can sort of do it and that it seems to work well in practice, but we don't understand it that well yet theoretically. So I would say we sort of have a few questions here. Should we sort of reconsider and assume that instead of doing this strategy or estimate policy, estimate upper confidence bound and iterate the two together, should we actually go and try to estimate some kind of upper bounds directly on Q star, whatever that would mean, rather than using this intermediate uh, upper confidence bounds on Q pi? Or is it actually effective to estimate these upper confidence bounds on our current Q pi's and iterate? Is it possible to say something theoretically about that? And finally, the last one, which seemed to be sort of important for all the algorithms I've seen so far, is that is it useful particularly to estimate these upper confidence bounds for fixed policies, but make sure that our estimates of our variance are further inflated to actually get the stochastic optimism? Is there some way we can say that, that those two very simple things to do could actually get us what we want? Okay, I'll leave it at that. Time for a couple questions. Oh, thank you. Very impressive talk. Uh, so I kind of like a uh, loose grasp of when you talked about this myopic behavior and the like uh, intuitive insight um, for the non tabular case. Could you maybe try to recap this a little bit? I'm sorry, I didn't actually hear the question. Well, the myopic case? Yeah, so you mentioned the myopic behavior, uh, mm -hmm. but because I was a little bit slipped just now, sorry. When you talk about this, uh, could you kind of like recap this and also your insight about when this can generalize to non-tabular case? Okay, I feel like I keep missing one word. Myopic behavior or, or optimal behavior? My, myopic. Myopic. Yeah. Okay, and so, uh, so I contrasted it to the myopic behavior setting and then the second question was 
Um, does this generalize to the myo myopic setting? Uh, to the like a uh, non-tabular setting. To the non-tabular setting. Yeah. Uh, oh, so so when it's this, I'm not sure exactly what this means, but maybe you mean the algorithm or the argument that I'm making. But the argument is really all about the non-tabular setting, because actually we sort of have a nice result in the tabular setting with RLSVI, though you could say we would like to generalize beyond the finite horizon setting. Um, so it, the algorithms themselves definitely extend to the function approximation approximation setting, not the tabular setting, because they're actually designed right away for the function approximation setting. What doesn't extend to that is the theory that's trying to say something about what these algorithms converge to. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think I missed part of your question, but. Any more questions? Well, in any case, feel free to come talk to me about this, this view about thinking about it a little bit like generalized policy iteration, because it's, it's not clear that other people think about it that way. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about it, uh, especially if you've worked on upper confidence bounds. Let's take it.